Welcome to the New York Business Leaders Podcast, presented by The Coil Group. We interview the most interesting and influential business leaders in New York and hear their stories of success, challenges, and lessons learned while building their businesses and personal brands. New episodes drop weekly, so please be sure to subscribe to get updates in your favorite stream. Without further delay, here's your host of the New York Business Leaders Podcast, Gordon Coyle. Welcome back to the show. Today, I think you're going to get a lot of value out of the conversation I had with Nelson Tepfer. Nelson's the founder and managing partner of Pro CFO Partners. His firm offers part-time CFOs to companies who either don't need or who can't afford a full-time chief financial officer, but they do have the need for that level of expertise and guidance that a CFO offers and provides. We get into some pretty interesting conversations, not just around finance and controls, but discuss things like strategic growth, goal setting, more importantly, goal attainment, as well as, well as other issues that mid-sized firms need to address today, but often don't know where to turn. Pro CFO Partners serves a broad spectrum of industries and company types and sizes across the nation. If you'd like to reach out to Nelson, you can check out his website, which is procfopartners.com, where you'll see his contact info in the About Us team tab. Or you can connect with him on LinkedIn, where he's posting some interesting content on a pretty regular basis. Now, before we get into the show, please give this a thumbs up if you're watching it on YouTube or a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform, which will help others find this show. And if you have an interesting story that you'd like to tell here on the New York Business Leaders Podcast, drop me an email and let's chat. My email, which will also appear in the show notes, is gbcoil at thecoilgroup.com. Now, on to the show. Hey, everyone. I'm Gordon Coyle. Welcome back to the New York Business Leaders Podcast. I'm really happy to have Nelson Tepfer on the phone with me today, or on the Zoom if you're watching this on uh, (laughs) YouTube, uh, but broadly on the show, how does that sound? Uh, Nelson is the CFO, I'm sorry, the owner or CEO of Pro CFO Partners. And I'd like to just have him spend a couple minutes. Nelson, welcome to the show. Why don't you spend a couple seconds and introduce yourself and your business? Hey, Gordon, thank you for having me on. So short version, I'm the co-founder and managing partner of Pro CFO Partners, where I lead a team now of around 30 CFOs providing part-time CFO services for companies that don't need, don't want, or cannot afford a full-time CFO. We believe most or most companies simply don't need a full-time CFO, and we feel somewhat qualified in making that statement as both myself and every member of the team have been an actual CFO before. And it's a lot more about because organizations, for the most part, it's not about having this person there 40, 50, 60 hours. It's about building out their finance and accounting function. So it is systematic, sustainable, and scalable, and actually built to support their growth and goals. Great. That's a good explanation. Tell us who your average or typical client is, what they look like, size, industry, all that sort of thing. So like most companies, we work with quite a range. You know, I think our smallest clients are funded startups pre-revenue and our largest clients are a few hundred million in revenue. But there are some very common issues that we get called in on. A lot of it has to do with the business owners struggling to wrap their arms around the organization as it stands today, meaning it's grown beyond what they are comfortable with through the finance and accounting lens. Many business owners are, well, almost all business owners are really, really good at delivering their product or service but running the business side of things, again, for most most business owners, never really were taught how to do this side of the things, as opposed to us who come from having actually been and done this in so many different industries. So when it comes to the size, you know, the, some of the common issues are developing better insight into their financials. That will look very different for a $2 million company than it might for an $80 million company. But it's the same underlying concept of developing that insight, developing that framework for financial management and growth. Sure. So tell us a little bit about your background, how you came to found this company, as well as the backgrounds and experiences of most of the consultants that work with you. Sure. So I came from actually having been a full-time CFO. As I jokingly refer to it, that was back when I used to work for a living. 
<laughs> and unlike many in this space, I wasn't like in between something when I decided to try this. I was actually what I thought at the time, pretty happily employed in a full-time CFO role. But a friend of mine had reached out to me and said, a friend of his is having some trouble with this company. Can I have a conversation? Maybe give him some advice, some tips and pointers. And I was, you know, sure. Help out a friend of a friend. Happy to have a conversation. And then that conversation turned into a year-long interim CFO role that I actually juggled with my full-time role. It was a very, very busy year. But what I discovered, as many who do this kind of work do, you know, discover pretty early on, and I use this word very carefully, it was so much more fun working this way. I learned an entirely new company, new business, new industry, and the things that were day-to-day in your previous role was really like magic to a company like this. It's like, wow, we can do this, and explain to them, yes, we can do this, and this is why we need to do this, and this is how we're going to do this. So I was pretty excited about that. So I went back to my full-time role, converted it into a part-time one, and then started taking on more clients on my own. Over the next dozen years or so, I worked, I'm sorry, over the next seven, seven and a half years or so, I worked across nearly a dozen industries from startups to half a billion in revenue, you know, and I was really having a lot of fun doing this. But what I discovered along the way is you keep running into the same three issues when you're trying to do this work on your own, which is what I was. It was just me doing this. Number one it was very difficult to develop and deliver. While you're working for your current clients, it's very difficult to maintain the pipeline, which therefore results in problem number two, it's feast or famine. You're either way too busy or not busy enough. And then the third one was more of an interesting one that I kept running into. You know, you only have your own experience and expertise to offer, which shows up in two ways. One is you get the, have you worked in this industry before? Now, for many, for many of the issues we help companies solve, they have nothing to do with the industry that they're in. That being said, it is a very common concern we hear from business owners. Now, because I was able to flex quickly enough into so many different industries, that, that aspect of it, I was able to overcome. But then the second one is more of a, I guess, theoretical issue, but it's kind of lonely when you're doing it by yourself. You don't have anyone to bounce the ideas off of. You don't have any colleagues. You don't have any teammates. So it's just whatever you know and whatever you're familiar with that you can offer the client. So... I was looking at ways of doing this bigger and better. I explored a whole bunch of different options. And eventually it was just, there's got to be a bigger and better way to do this. That eventually that eventually led me to co-found this company with my partner. And there are now more than 30 of us on the team doing this. That's great. And are the other team members, do they have the same background? Did they kind of come to this role the same way that you did? So half of my team came directly from full-time corporate roles and half came from trying this on their own. Okay. Okay. And they come for different reasons. So again, everyone has been the CFO. So the ones who are coming from the full-time role, many of them are, well, I did this for enough of my time. Now I want more freedom and flexibility in my life or I want to change, or I want to do something different, or I think I can have a more impact consulting. I mean, we have one who was telling me it's not fun anymore. The company I was with got too big. It just wasn't fun working there anymore. So I left and decided I could help smaller companies now. For the ones who tried this on their own, they liked the concept of it, but again, they didn't have, they, they kept running into versions of those three problems as well. So our model and our solution and our function, the way we work together and the framework we develop for helping, you know, for how we work with our clients really enables them to be more successful. And it provides a lot of that framework around them for them to be able to be more effective in helping their clients succeed. Yeah, interesting. And, and I kind of find the same thing in my career on the fun level is, is that you know, you can do what you do every day and be successful, but I get to interact with a lot of different business owners in a lot of different industries, a lot of different verticals from small startups to small public companies that, you know, you it's a different engagement every day, every couple of hours, it's a different conversation. And that's what I find really fun about what I do and what keeps me so engaged in my business on a regular basis. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think at last count, we're in 26 or 27 different industries. So you're talking about the varied conversations we have yeah. throughout the day. And to your point, they certainly keep, our, they certainly keep yeah. us on our toes, but it's so interesting to have some of the same conversations that this type of company or this size company is having and seeing the versions of it at the either the much smaller level or the much larger level. Right. And, and kind of going back to some of the conversations or questions that you get asked by prospective customers, have you ever worked in this industry? You know, have you ever, you know, handled a commercial bakery? Well, maybe I've never handled a commercial bakery, but I've handled other food manufacturers or processors. You know, not that insurance is insurance and 
CFO work is CFO work. Everything is nuanced. But, you know, I've been doing it for 40 years, and I'm sure you've been doing it a long time, too. You, you get such a breadth of understanding and knowledge of the right questions to ask, the right sorts of conversations to have, to uncover what the truths are, to help the client, you know, improve the bottom line for both of us. Absolutely. Absolutely. And especially when we get involved in those strategic conversations, that process of strategic planning, you know, defining those goals, where are we trying to be in five years? You know, what are the measurable targets for our success if we're going to do that? That process of going through that planning, that's very often common across almost every different, almost every industry. Mm -hmm. Now, are there specific strategies that apply to one industry versus another? Of course, but right. we work as a team. And what we've discovered is that our long-term success in working with our clients and our clients' long-term success in working with us is more often dependent on that CFO on our team being a very good fit with that business owner. So what we look for very often is the fit with the business owner, perhaps even before industry experience. As I jokingly tell all of our clients and our team, industry experience and knowledge, I can leverage from other people on the team. And the CFO is working with you can talk to the other CFO who worked in that industry. But the personality fit with the business owner and the leadership, that I can't leverage. So right. that's going to be very often more one of the things I look for first, but also going to be one of more of the defining factors of success. Got it. In, in your opinion, what is the trigger in the mind of the business owner, the CEO that says, I need help, I'm not, I'm not getting this, or I'm in trouble, or, you know, I'm sure that there's a million different reasons, but what's the common thread behind the business owner actually picking up the phone and saying, I, I need some help, I need expertise in this area? So it does come across from a bunch of different factors. So I'll list a few of the more common ones. You know, as companies are growing, there's that financial operations piece, which is just no longer working the way the business owner needs to do. Now, what that can look like could be, it takes us too long to close our month. So I don't have the insight I need to when I'm making decisions. Or I remember one prospect telling it, the way he put it to me was the best version I've heard it. He tells me, Nelson, this company is too big for me to run on gut instinct alone. <laughs> And that really highlights a lot of what, what, well, what, what prompts people to reach out to us or prompts other trusted advisors to refer us. So that's one aspect to it. Some of it can be more the direction, like, okay, we're, 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 we're trying to get to this big concept or big idea and we're having trouble getting there. So for us, it becomes how we define those goals, how we define those measurable targets, how we build the strategies to help them do this as well as then what are the KPIs we're measuring towards that success. For us, it becomes, sometimes it becomes putting that framework around their vision to say, okay, now that you, we've expressed this vision, we've articulated it, we've communicated it, what are the different pieces and factors that are involved in, how, in actually executing it through, again, we look at it through the financial lens because we're CFOs, but a lot of it comes up to, uh, comes up to the strategic level. Now, there are a bunch of different factors involved. There's cash flow issues sometimes, you know, there's profitability, shrinking margins. How do we approach those? But, you know, if I had to point, I'd say it's usually among those four to six different elements of among the most common or most prevalent when we get called in. And very often it's more than one. You know, the, there's a lot of different issues. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately or fortunately, no one really says, you know, everything is going great. Let's call in a part time or fractional or outsource CFO. No one really does that. It would make my job much easier if they did. But no one really does that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How often do you get the call? Oh, we're, everything is fine on our insurance. We just decided to give you a call and see what's going on. You know, That's so right. it's, uh, there, there's, unfortunately, there has to be some pain usually before they start looking for the solution or for the painkiller. So, you know, we, we love being more strategic and proactive. And we have been called in by some forward thinking strategic business owners to say, OK, you know, I was able to get us to here. We're looking at what's next for the company. And we think we need this extra help at this level to help us do that. Those are, the, those are among the most fun conversations because it allows the business owners to approach it strategically, not from a pain point, not from a, oh, no, we have this problem we need your help with, but from a, okay, let's think about this bigger. You know, where, where are we trying to get to and what are the pieces I'm going to need to help us get there? Yeah, I would think that strategic conversations with successful people are a lot more fun, a lot more, a lot more progressive than the distress phone call, like my hair is on fire and I, I need yes. help putting it out. Absolutely. Uh, how do you, um, so, so let's say a mid-sized company, no CFO, they've got a bookkeeper, they've got a CPA, 
how do you fit into the role there with those other two people that one's inside the firm as a bookkeeper? And I know that that's, you know, just record keeping. It's not strategic, but they have an outside CPA that may be visiting with them on a, on a regular basis. How, how does that so, work? So we actually work really, really well with, out with, with accountants because we're not there to do their taxes. And perhaps more importantly, we are there, are there to make sure they're working with the right accountant, because very often when we get called in, business owners have outgrown a lot of their professional relationships, you know, even for the work that you do. I mean, how often do you get called in similarly when it's like, OK, they have the same insurance broker that they've used for whatever number of decades. And you know, once a year they get a call, this is your renewal and new price where they really should be getting something quite a bit more. But business owners don't know what they should be getting from some of these professionals. And us as CFOs, we recognize this is what you should get from your banker, from your accountant, from your lawyer, from your insurance broker, from your risk advisor, from, you know, from all these different pieces. So we work really, really well with good accounting firms and good accountants because we see the need to bring them into our clients. And also our roles are very different. The best accountants in the world, they can't get operational the way we can. It's just a different business model, so different service offering. So they're a crucial part in the tax planning conversations, you know, and what that actually looks like and how what they should be doing for a lot of this. They're brilliant professionals. We love, you know, we use them as a resource the same way any internal CFO would of a company. You know, or every larger company has an internal CFO and an accounting firm. So, you know, for us, we're just a part-time CFO with all-time commitment. We take on the role of the CFO just on a part-time basis. Right. Okay. Got and we and, and talking about the internal side, we manage that bookkeeper. We manage the rest of that accounting function. So we become when they have a question of how to do something, they call us. But now they have someone they can call. Or when they run into an issue of they're not sure what came up over here, they call us. When we put in new systems and processes around some of the financial functions and operations, we're the ones giving that instruction to them. It's like, okay, this is how we build our clients. This is how we collect. This is how we enter information because this is what we're trying to do. And we become their mentor you know, along that path to get there. I remember being called into one client where you know we're talking to the owner of the company and their bookkeeper, and he says, you know, he wants to grow the bookkeeper into a larger role in the company. And that was part of one of the objectives that we were set with to help this person transition into a larger role within the finance and accounting function. Interesting. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you get a lot of business through trusted referral sources. Typically, yeah. who are those by category uh, <laughs> sources? So I always joke about it as defining it not by category, but anyone who hears the complaints of the business owner. <laughs> <laughs> because there are some professionals business owners feel comfortable complaining to, and some they do not. So it's not always category. It's almost sometimes it's almost more just about the relationship that they have with the business owner. Usually it is the same ones we referenced earlier when we recognize the value for those relationships as well. It is the banker, it is the lawyer, it is the accountant, it is the insurance. It can be wealth advisors. I mean, I've been called in by all different kinds of areas and functions. Sometimes it's just through people I know from years ago who now know what I'm doing and they come into a scenario where it's like, oh, you're complaining about this about your business. Someone was just telling me about this. You should give Nelson a call. He and his team may be able to help. Great, great. Um, can you give us maybe a specific example of a challenge that a client faced and, and how you were able to interact with them and what the end result was? Kind of like a success story for a client. Sure. I mean, we can give all different kinds, but I'll give, you know, perhaps some different size ones. We're talking to one smaller manufacturer distributor. And we, when we were initially called in, they were actually having some cash flow issues. But what they really, unfortunately, again, or unfortunately, did not realize that their cash flow issues were really caused by their accountant. And when I say this, what actually happened was this is a young entrepreneur a very successful business, still young. So he doesn't have, he is not like a serial entrepreneur who's done this a whole bunch of times. He's a first time you know, business owner. And he tells his accountant essentially, you know, great when we're doing tax planning, you know, he says, oh, we don't want to pay any taxes. So everything we can write off, or, or, you know, that was his approach to it. Now, we understand it. It's legal. There are a lot of things you can do on that side and didn't cross any lines from a legality perspective. But what the account did not tell this business owner was, sure, we can do this. But then if you want to actually go to a bank for a real line of credit, they're not really going to give you anything because you're not you know, you're not showing them anything they feel comfortable lending you any money on. 
And unfortunately, that's what happened. So he did not get a real line of credit from a bank. And therefore, when he did run into other cash flow issues, he turned to the resource for every first time entrepreneur, Google, and searching for cash flow issues. Now, if you search for cash for, for funding solutions on Google, you're going to get the really, really, really expensive uh, types of funding. And unfortunately, that's what he had in place. Oh. So when we stepped in, you know, we cleaned up their books, we brought them to a new account, we introduced them to two banks who gave them a real line of credit and a term loan to take out the really higher level of funding. That's just one example. But, you know, from our perspective, it's because of these are all the pieces that were intertwined with this, where it's not just, oh, it's a cash flow issue. It's like, okay, why is there a cash flow issue? What are the different pieces that are going on here? You have a cash flow issue, you're making high debt payments. Why are we making high debt payments? What's that, you know, and tracking that all the way down to understand what's really going on. So when we think of that framework for financial management and growth, these are all pieces of the puzzle. And the solutions that we want to put in place are not just, okay, great, here's, our, here's another report for you to look at once a month, thank you, and goodbye. The solutions that we want to build are in support of that framework. It's, okay, great, we need a different bank, but do we need a different bank just for right now? Or do we need a different bank because we're also trying to grow next year? So we, it's not just a line of credit, just a, a term loan, just to take out this specific funding. We also need a little bigger line of credit to support where we want to grow. You know, for some of our larger clients, it can, get, it can get even more involved. You know, some of them can be ERP selection and implementation, whereas we're not the computer software programmers, but we're the ones who know what it's supposed to look like at the end. So we can get more in that. And again, it becomes strategic. Why are we choosing to put a new, a new system in place? What does this actually look like? Uh, that's we've been called in on that scenario, for instance. We've also been called in when a business owner was thinking about selling their company. And what are the different pieces and processes they need to go through? We're not the investment bankers or the M&A advisor or the M&A attorney, but for that business owner, it was, what do we need to build in the company that's going to support that exit or that size of an exit that they really want so they can go live the lifestyle they've earned? So how do we build out the systems and processes so he gets the higher multiple? How do we remove the business owner from day-to-day -day operations so he doesn't take a hit on valuation? How do we build a robust financial reporting system so anyone who's looking at this feels comfortable, everything that's going on, they're not going through this process and putting more on, on the earnout and putting more of it up front. There are so many different factors and variables on that process. From our perspective, it was, again, through that strategic financial lens of what are the different pieces that need to be put in place and how do we actually do that? Got it. And, and on the M&A front, if somebody was a business owner was kind of in the back of their mind saying, I've got, <clears throat> I want to retire at 65 and I'm 60 now. When, I know the answer to this question, but <laughs> just for the audiences, for the listeners uh, perspective, when should that business owner be thinking about having a set of books that are legible, well put together, strategic, done professionally rather than, you know, haphazardly done. How many years? In I advance? think we actually, <laughs> I think we actually wrote a piece about this uh, a couple months ago. And what we basically tell everyone is run your company like you're going to sell it tomorrow, because regardless of whether you do or don't, that will provide a much greater, a much stronger function if you know someone could potentially be looking at it. Now, are there different things that come into play, whether you're running it as a private company, never going to sell, and then whether you're ready to sell it? Of course. But what we tell everyone is, well, unfortunately, the flip side to that is universally, almost every business owner, I believe, you know, is operating under two things, which they kind of know, but don't really address until it's too late. One is they all think their business sells faster than it does, and they all think it's worth more than it is. For sure. So we've been brought into conversations where it's like, okay, we're, we're debating what our options are. Should we sell? Should we hire a management team? Or should we, you know, what are, what are our different options? Because they built a very successful business. And we were brought in to say, okay, what are the real options? If you were to sell, what does it look like right now? And what are the different things you can put in place to improve that valuation? If you're going to switch to an owner, to a manager type of function, what are the pieces you want to put in place that's going to support your level of oversight that you plan on having while still allowing them to grow and succeed in their new roles? So that's how we tend to think of it. But to answer your question on how far in advance, well, <laughs> well, what's that funny, the old expression, right? The day you start planning the sales, the day you open your business type of thing, the day you plan your exit is the day, day after you open it. So <laughs> the answer is it's never early enough. It should always have been done. It should always be as early as possible because 
the structure you need to go through, the insight you need to provide others on what when they look at your business for a transaction is helpful for anyone in running their business as well. That's great advice. Yeah. But now, now that you asked me that question, and I know you have your own version of the answer, what's the answer you usually provide when you get asked that question? Um, my answer to that uh, question is you better call Nelson and have a conversation with him. <laughs> <laughs> That's great information. So Nelson, we're kind of getting to the end of the conversation. What am I missing here? What else would you like to kind of throw into the mix here or kind of tell our listeners about? So for, for all business owners out there, I mean, A, there's a lot of help out there to actually go and look for it. One of the most common conversations we get, we hear, or common responses we hear when we first get called in is, oh, you mean this is very common, the issues we're facing, because it's very lonely when you're running a business and doing these things on your own. So yes, the answer to your question is most of the issues business owners are facing are not unique to them, but they are all encompassing to the business owner, but there is a lot of help out there. So talk to your trusted advisors, ask them about the different resources, open up about some of the issues you're having. Many of them have seen it before and have advised many of them on how to overcome them before. And I think that goes back to what we said earlier that a lot of business owners, they, they know what they know. And they may be working yeah. on assumptions that they adopted 25 or 30 or 40 years earlier. And <clears throat> like you said, they only, they think, oh, this is a unique problem to me. And it's kind of interesting. I've heard that as well. And it's like, no, nope, I, <laughs> this happens all the time. It's an interesting perspective. Absolutely. I remember when I get, when I get a call with a prospect recently, you know, and then it, we're summarizing the conversation. I said, well, out of the 10 most common things we get called in on, I think you checked about eight of them. <laughs> And he just burst out laughing because these are very common issues that we see having done this for as many companies as we have across the industries and sizes that we have. Some of the things, again, they're common issues. You know, some of the solutions and the processes we put in place are built off of our experience of having done this before as full-time CFOs and as as part-time fractional CFOs as well, helping these organizations build their framework for financial management and growth. And you just mentioned, you know, the word fractional again, and, and I think it's important to understand that uh, I'm, I'm assuming here that every engagement is customized to the client's needs. There's no set number of hours per month, is there? There is no set number of hours to that extent. We don't even bill our clients hourly. I never want a client to think if they should or shouldn't call us based on the bill they're going to see at the end of the month. So we set their goals and objectives and the level of engagement that we think makes sense for them, but it is flexible. We don't tie our clients to any long-term contracts or commitments. If we're not helping them on an ongoing basis, we believe we shouldn't be working together. I don't need to tie them to a longer term contract that would be helpful for them. So we, t we look at our role as we are their CFO just on a part-time basis. It's that part-time CFO with all time commitment. Got it. And if somebody wanted to explore a conversation, how does that first conversation look? Is it, um, is it a build situation? Are you billing for that first conversation? Is it a Absolutely not. Absolutely okay. not. Our first conversation with me or my partner or one of our managing directors is usually about, okay, what's going on in the company that makes you think to reach out to someone like us? Let's talk about the role of the finance and accounting function as, as it applies to the issues you're describing. I have had conversations with clients where at the end of it, I explained to them, we're happy to try and help, but we don't think you need us. You need this kind of solution. And here's three introductions I can make for you. So that first conversation is very exploratory, usually educational, but focused around the issues that they're facing and what would be our role in actually helping them overcome these issues. If it makes sense, then sure, the next conversation, I'll introduce one of the CFOs on my team uh, who would be a good fit for those specific issues. And we can get into specifics around, this is how you know, we've, we've discussed our role in general. This is specifically how we would have this person on our team would work with you in helping you overcome these issues. That's great. And I'm sure that that's a huge relief to a business owner that doesn't know where to turn when they need advice mm -hmm. or they've got a problem they think is really unique to them. They just need a sounding board to see who's the right person to, to go with on this. Absolutely. And that's exactly why we chose our name so deliberately as pro CFO partners. We partner with the business owners. We become their partner in their growth and success along the way. Just as we partner with all the CFOs on our team to give them a platform to practice in a way that's meaningful for them. We believe every business owner deserves an expert CFO to help guide their success. One of the questions I just thought of is geography. Are you guys kind of 
here in the Northeast or in the metro area, or do you, are you spread out around the country? So I think the one silver lining of COVID is certainly we picked up clients all over the country. You know, as I joked with someone recently, and someone asked me where I met this other professional from, I said, you know, where was this professional from? And I said, this person was from Zoom. And that's where everyone's from these days, right? <laughs> <laughs> so our, our, our team is, yeah, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Pennsylvania. We have my partner, and we have a team in the Chicago and the Midwest area as well. But we now have clients, and I think just about every state in the country, or right. certain, if not if not every state, then most of the states in, in the country we have clients in. Uh, for us, you know, the work that we do, again, the Zoom environment has certainly blossomed in, in providing this kind of service. Yep. We do go into many of our clients' offices as well, if that's, what's, if that's their working model right now. It's not like, for us, it's not, no, we only do virtual. For us, it's really about what, what works for the client, what's going to allow us to be successful with the client. Because if I don't think we can be successful in providing the service of what this client needs, I will very happily let them know that in the first conversation and say, no, I'm not so sure we can help, but here are a few introductions I might be able to make for you who would be able to help you. Great, great. All good information. So to be respectful of your time and the listener's time, I want to wrap it up in a few minutes but want to throw it to you. Is there anything we missed that we didn't talk about that you'd like to kind of put into the conversation? Well, there, there's a whole bunch of stuff we can get involved with, but again, to be cognizant of everyone's time, uh, you know, I'm very happy to put a leave it here. Um, if anyone would like more information, we have a lot of information on our website at procfopartners.com. A lot of just general information education. We also have some great tools for many business owners, whether it's break-even analysis or goals and strategies exercise to actual topical conversations on industry or on different areas within the finance and accounting function for them to see, hear us describe it in a podcast that we have, as well as actually read some of the content that we use to actually talk about what we do. There's a lot of information on there. Please feel, you know, please feel free to check it out at procfopartners.com. Great. And if somebody wanted to reach out directly to you, Nelson, how's the best way to do that? Uh, our contact information is up on the website. My email address is my first name and last name, nelson.tepfer at procfopartners.com. Great. Welcome. Any conversations. Always enjoy meeting and talking to new people. Fantastic. I'll, uh, I'll make sure that your email address and the, uh, the link to your website is in the show notes and in the description box if people are watching this on uh, YouTube. Nelson, it's been a great conversation. I really appreciate you spending time with us today um, and look forward to chatting again in the near future. Uh, everyone, Thank you, Gordon. It's, been, oh, it's been a lot of fun. Same here. Everyone, I'm Gordon Coyle, host of the New York Business Leaders Podcast. Thank, thanks for watching or listening. If you've got an interesting, interesting story that you'd like to tell on this podcast, I'd love to hear from you. My email address will also, also appear in the show notes and in the description box on YouTube reach out to me and let's connect. Let's have a conversation and get you on the show. Thanks and have a great day. That's it for this week's episode of the New York Business Leaders Podcast. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss next week's episode. In the meantime, find more interviews and resources at nybusinessleaders.com.